Athens, Greece. A city alive with commerce and culture. It is also a city of faith, Greek Orthodox faith, part of the great Eastern arm of Christianity. But there was another world here once, of which only tantalizing fragments remain. Those who reach back through time, both above ground and below, are in search of a world that was equally alive and equally devout, the world of the ancient Greeks. It still speaks to us today through one of its legacies, Greek mythology. It was populated by many gods and goddesses, each with certain powers in the world, and each with a story of their own. For tens of thousands of years, predating biblical times, accounts of the gods and their doings were passed down by storytellers. It is extremely hard, but one tries to fantasize of what was it like in those days. I think favorite stories of gods uh, must have been, uh, thinking back, what did the child think and was impressed about was, how did Zeus give birth to Athena from a headache? Apollo, who was a very wild young man, who then developed into being the god of order, of music, of art. Poseidon, who would create storms when he was angry. Athena, who was the protector of our capital city and was in favor of peace. Presiding over all was Zeus, god of the sky, god of thunder. Zeus is a sky god, and you're in the domain of Zeus when you're out there in nature. Zeus had some control over whether you had a good day or a bad day, and a good life or a bad life. He had two jars on the door sill, and there was a jar of good and a jar of evil. And to each man, Zeus would pour out a portion of good and a portion of evil. There was Aphrodite and Artemis, two sides of the same coin. Aphrodite, and what is she the goddess of? Um, she is the goddess of sexuality, female sexuality. She's a goddess of beauty. She's associated with lots of fertility issues. You have Artemis on the other side. Artemis, who is this chaste, chaste virgin. And Apollo, who like all the gods and goddesses of ancient Greece, had more than one power. He is the organizer, the civilizer. He's the one who brings uh, roads to places where there were never roads before. He's the one who heals, but he also can bring plague. And this is something that happens in the case of many Greek gods. If they can cause something, they can also stop it. He was a god, I've heard it most brilliantly put, a god of distance. And therefore, he would deal with people not face to face and hand to hand. He was better at shooting his bow and killing people from a very far off distance. And therefore, his loves, perhaps, are best kept at a distance, too. These gods and goddesses evolved as the ancient Greeks sought to find meaning, and perhaps faith, in an often challenging world. Their stories were embellished and changed over time, as different civilizations came into contact with ancient Greece. Greece has been inhabited since about 70,000 BCE, and there were invasions of people from the Middle East and from the North, and each invasion led to not another set of divinities, but uh, further layers of uh, divinity added to the existing divinities. So Greek gods are a real amalgam of multiple cultures cultures of the Middle East, mostly. The Greek gods were of such diversity that they 
are unlike any many of the other gods from around the Mediterranean because they incorporated elements of a lot of different peoples around them and they don't clearly match a lot of the other peoples say in Celtic or Italian religions. These stories were passed down through oral tradition but sometime around 750 BC they were collected, organized and written down. Although scholars debate whether one author or many authors were involved in this effort, the popular belief is that there was just one, Homer. As far as we know, the real crystallization of Greek mythology was around the time of Homer, 750 BC. And with Homer, we find the creation of Greek mythology and the creation of the gods. Homer gave the Greeks their gods. Homer was effectively the closest thing the Greeks had to a Bible. In the beginning, Homer tells us, there was Okeanos, a spirit in the form of a great circular endless river flowing eternally back upon itself. There was another presence too, Tethys, sometimes called the first mother. When they finally made it, they began the line of descent which eventually produced the gods and goddesses of the ancient Greeks. Some 50 years after Homer, the poet Hesiod composes the Theogony in which he too describes the creation of the gods. But according to Hesiod, the world began differently. First, there was a supernatural presence called chaos, by which Hesiod means emptiness not disorder. Once upon a time, there was chaos. And after chaos, there was a goddess called Gaia, Earth. And Gaia slept with, married, mated, Uranus, heavens. Uranus, however, did not want children. He felt threatened by them and kept them from being born. Gaia conspires with Kronos, one of her unborn children, who castrates his father, presumably from within his mother's womb. Oranos' severed genitals fall into the sea, from which a surprising entity emerges, Aphrodite, goddess of love. These stories make up what is known as Greek mythology, derived from the Greek word mythos. It implies something untrue. But for the ancient Greeks, these stories were a matter of faith. They helped explain how and why the world works as it does. Interestingly, love and war, or violence and sex, are deeply connected in Greek mythology, and not only in Greek mythology, but in a number of mythologies. Why? are these two things deeply connected. I think that the ancient peoples, and certainly the Greeks, felt that deeply passionate feelings were somehow connected in the human mind and in the human emotions. That is, great desires and great fears or great hatreds were somehow linked. In this way, the stories and characters of Greek mythology had real-life application. Hesiod's creation story goes on to tell how Kronos frees his brothers and sisters from Gaia's womb. These beings would be known as the Titans, born only after their father has been castrated. The theme of conflict between father and son continues, as Kronos himself now kills his own children. Kronos married Rhea. Every time Rhea gave birth, he'd swallow the children. Uh, Rhea desperately wanted to have some children, and so she took one baby, Zeus, when he was born, and wrapped him up and hid him in a cave in Crete to be raised, and gave Kronos a stone wrapped up in swaddling clothes that he swallowed so that he thought he was swallowing the baby. Well, Zeus grew up, came, attacked his father, and all the children emerged. 
Uh, and those were the beginnings of the Olympian gods. Zeus retrieves the rock with which his mother deceived his father. It can be seen even now at the sacred shrine of Delphi. There's always a kind of inherent conflict and tension between fathers and sons. Greece has been, really until this century, a subsistence economy. And so if you have a small farm, the father is in charge of that. The son, even the first son, is not going to get any kind of rights until the father moves on, retires or dies. What is the concern there? There's a real concern, obviously, about issues of succession and power. After Zeus rescues his brothers and sisters from their father, they seize Mount Olympus. From this stronghold, they battle for control of the world against their father, aunts, and uncles, all of whom are titans. Finally, the gods and goddesses of Olympus prevail. They acknowledge Zeus, who is also god of the sky, as their king. But human beings have yet to appear on the scene. The story of creation in Greek mythology goes on in Hesiod's telling. Generations of gods continue to struggle with one another, all before humanity's arrival in the cosmos. I think it says something very interesting about a culture, whether it, it considers its formative moments to be ones of conflict, are ones of sort of unified production, peaceful production. I am overwhelmed each time I study or teach a course that deals with Greek mythology, how persistent these conflicts are. After triumphing over the Titans, the great god Zeus marries Metis, a Titan herself, and therefore his aunt. Eventually, they have a daughter who bursts fully grown and armed from his forehead. This is Athena, goddess of warriors. Other gods and goddesses enter the world, each with different functions. They all have, however, one thing in common, an attribute which sets them apart from virtually all other divinities in the ancient world. Their images are human. If you think of Egyptian religion, with its gods having animal heads, various animal bodies, or Near Eastern, uh, Akkadian, Mesopotamian, Hittite religion, where you see uh, divinities associated with lions and other fierce animals, the Greeks' decision to somehow represent the gods as being like Greeks is really an innovation. And we're not really sure where it came from. When you think about divinity, you're talking about the unknown. And you really can only talk about the unknown in terms of the known. In the Hebrew Bible, in Genesis, it says, God came down and he walked in the Garden of Eden in the cool of the evening. It's almost impossible to talk about divinities without doing something like that. Xenophanes said, if horses could draw, Horses would draw their gods as horses. In Homer's telling, it is only after the gods and goddesses take up residence on Mount Olympus that the story of human beings begins to unfold. The Judeo-Christian account of the world's beginning culminates in God's creation of man, who was given dominion over all the other creatures on earth. However, the ancient Greeks believe the birth of humans is of little importance to the cosmos. Although the Greeks had a human-centered universe, their view of man was almost as an afterthought. He was a smaller creature in the universe, something certainly lesser than the gods. And therefore, the creation of humans had to take a second or third place down the line in the Greek world of the cosmos and the Olympian deities. So why was the 
creation of man given such a small role in the creation of the universe. It could be that Greeks just assume that human beings were always around, that human beings are in fact so important that there was never a stage when they didn't exist. Um, it's still something of a mystery. I like to think that Greek myth reflects a certain understanding of, by the Greeks of humans' place in the world, that humans are not the center of things, uh, that there are, there's a whole wealth of the created world into which humans have to fit. This is a great contrast with a number of other cultures and belief systems. As with the dawn of the gods, Greek mythology contains different tellings of the creation of man. In none of them are mankind's beginnings auspicious. We live like ants in the ground, and we couldn't read, and we didn't know the seasons, and we didn't know the weather, and we couldn't think, and we couldn't hear. We were just despicable worms, and worth despising. In Homer's version of the creation of humans, the god Prometheus forms the first man out of mud and breathes life into him. In Hesiod's telling, Zeus creates succeeding races of men, gold, silver, bronze, and iron. It seems that each race symbolizes differing aspects of the human condition. The first race of men is made of gold. Their lives are easy, their crops abundant. They literally feast with the gods. In the beginning, there was a golden age and people lived on the earth and all the crops grew of their own accord and everybody was good and everybody was just. And those people, after a while, just disappeared. The golden race appeared to have lived a perfect existence, seemingly in paradise. And yet, this race vanishes without explanation. In the biblical account of paradise, life's hardships are seen as a result of Adam and Eve's fall from grace in the Garden of Eden. For the golden race of men in Greek mythology, there is no such explanation for their disappearance. The reason for their fate remains a mystery. The Greek system in which humans and their creation are not really a topic of concern is so different from what you find in Genesis, where we have this focus on the, the creation of the first man. Of course, in Genesis, it's related to the further story, what happened after the first man and woman disobeyed God. In Greek myth, disobeying the gods is not such a big deal as it is in Genesis. So why doesn't Hesiod have an answer, or why doesn't Hesiod give an answer to why the uh, golden a race came to an end. With the Judeo-Christian myth of the fall from the, the Garden of Eden, because that clearly was the fault of uh, Adam and Eve. And, and what that means is there is no real, really good explanation for why the world is so difficult now. Why humans can't have an easy time. After the golden race becomes extinct, Zeus fashions men from silver. But this race is not very evolved. The Silver Age people were babies forever, and then they had this short period of maturity, and then they had a horrible old age. And they disappeared under the earth. They were more arrogant and did not worship the gods sufficiently. Next come men of bronze, who exterminate themselves through constant warfare. Eventually, the race of men who live today appears. They are said to be men of iron. So basically, this story of degeneration has moved to the present age, where actually it shows a balance in these various views of the important things in life for the Greeks. Namely, your attitudes to the gods and your attitudes towards warfare and fighting for your city-state and how you can get along or not get along with each other. Interestingly, all these stories account for the creation of only half the human race, man. 
woman is created as an affliction, a punishment, and all because of a trick. The first woman was sent to the earth as a punishment to mankind. Now this sounds incredibly misogynistic, and it was an incredibly misogynistic story on the part of Hesiod, who told this in 700 BC. But the story goes that one of the gods, Prometheus, tried to trick the master and king of all the cosmos, Zeus. Prometheus is a trickster god, he's a smart god. Prometheus means forethought. Uh, he, he killed a sheep, and he took the sheep, and he took all the good, wonderful meat, and he put it inside the disgusting belly. And he took all the bare bones, and he wrapped them up in the beautiful white shining fat, which is, of course, what burns in a sacrifice. And he presented these two bundles to Zeus, and he said, you pick. Zeus knows he is being tricked by Prometheus, who represents humankind. In retaliation, Zeus punishes man by taking away fire. Prometheus, in return, steals the fire back and gives it to humanity. And by stealing and giving men this gift of fire, he was therefore punished indirectly by having a woman created who was given uh, to human beings. Now, Zeus didn't just sort of uh, give this evil thing, as he thought, to mankind. He called it a beautiful evil. She's one you can't do without. She's a kalon kakon in the terms of the Greek, a beautiful bad thing. And so Greek myth, Greek poetry likes to have it both ways. Women are beautiful. Women are something irresistible. At the same time, women make you work. And so they're a bad thing. I do think that throughout Greek mythology, you see a repeated emphasis on the threat that women pose. The threat they pose because of your need for them, the need to have children, and the very real fear of losing control because of desire. The overwhelming feminine sexuality threatens men. Zeus does not give just any woman to men. Indeed, he gives men a kalon kaikon, a beautiful evil. Her name is Pandora, and she comes with a jar full of evils to let loose in the world. The first woman in Greek mythology is Pandora, and her story echoes that of Eve and the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. Given a jar and told not to open it, Pandora does so anyway. And all the evils of the world are let loose. All sickness, pain, suffering, disease. Too late, she closes the jar, leaving only one thing behind, hope. But what is hope doing in Pandora's jar full of evils? Hope is there as an evil, which is, I think, fascinating. Um, hope is an evil because hope allows you to act with the sense that you can control the future. And in Hesiod, that is a very dangerous thing to do. You can't control the future, and to be, it's to act under a delusion. Is hope something good or something bad? And the Greeks loved this kind of dilemma because hope was, could be good, could be bad, and so it was ambiguously left back in the jar for humans to use or to avoid. Pandora is perhaps the most prominent but certainly not the only example of women being a source of evil in Greek mythology. Some scholars find a deeper meaning for this disparagement of women and point to Aphrodite, the goddess of love. If you look at the myths of Aphrodite, who is the most beautiful and the most sexually desirable 
thing ever. Um, men are afraid of her. She, she sees a man, a human being, Anchises, on a hill outside of Troy, and she wants to sleep with him. And she goes to him and he says, you are too beautiful to be a, a human. You must be a goddess and I don't want to sleep with you. And she says, oh no, I'm just a maiden from the neighborhood. They go to bed together and when he wakes up, she's become her goddess self. And he's terrified, he's terrified he's going to be emasculated, that he'll lose his, his strength. In contrast, the ancient Greeks believed that Athena, a goddess without a sexual role, is a great force for good. Athena is the protector. Uh, Athena is the warrior divinity who leads the just defense war. She is the city goddess and in many respects the most important divinity the Athenians have. And that might be true for many other cities where you have a necropolis with the temple of Athena uh, on top. And thus the world of Greek gods and goddesses is not merely a collection of colorful stories, but a window on an ancient civilization, its thoughts and its values. The kind of non-linear thinking that you see in myths, the sort of narratives that leap all around, that introduce strange creatures, look a lot like dreams. And so the question, I think, is whether Greek myths are somehow the collective unconsciousness of Greek civilization at an early period. Whether conscious or unconscious, the gods are very much present in the everyday lives of ancient Greeks. In each of the mountains, in each of the plants, in each of the emotions they felt, they felt that there was a god in control behind this. One of the attractive and unusual things about Greek religion from the beginning is its responsiveness to environment. There are nymphs, for example, who inhabit watery places. There are nymphs of the mountains, nymphs of the trees. There's an acknowledgement that rivers are a kind of religious force. And Greek religion in this way has a certain affiliation with modern ecology the recognition that individual places have a value, a kind of numinous quality, a sacred quality. The Greeks had particular terms for sacred. In fact, they had several terms for sacred. One of them is hieros, and hieros means that it belongs to the gods. In fact, the Greek word for religion is tahira, the sacred things. And so, the stories in Greek mythology are used to explain an often difficult and random world. Winter is born when Persephone, daughter of the goddess Demeter, is kidnapped by the god Hades and taken to the underworld to be his bride. Demeter was horrendously upset to have lost her daughter and began searching the world, looking for her daughter couldn't find her daughter, was wept, cried, crops didn't grow, hence the gods weren't getting sacrificed. So finally, some gods went to, to Zeus and said, you know, you've got to get Persephone back so our mother makes the crops grow so we get our sacrifices and all the people don't die. Eventually, Persephone is allowed to return to her mother on one condition. Each year, Persephone must spend three months with Hades. It is during this time that her mother, Demeter, goddess of agriculture, is inconsolable. And thus, each year, the fields lie barren in the cold of winter. And thus, life's larger hardships were explained. Personal difficulties, however, were often explained by some offense to the gods. Those who offended the gods were punished, not by some earthly authority, but by the gods themselves. There's a Greek word, in fact, desidaimonia, which means uh, fear of the gods or respect for the gods. And this was a positive thing. 
life was felt to be fairly precarious and you needed to do everything you could to get whatever powers ruled the world on your side to keep safe. Many of them lived one drought away from uh, starvation and you just didn't mess around with the world like that. One of the things I love about Greek myth is it never lets people off the hook. It never says, this happened because the gods made it happen. It's our fault if we can just understand why. It's sort of a, I think, a difficult world to exist in. In a difficult world, people often look for a hero, someone to bring deliverance from a life seemingly filled with adversity. Some believe a child born of a Greek god and an earthly woman prefigures the appearance of Christ. Was this destined to happen? One of the most famous figures in Greek mythology may possibly have helped pave the way for a later event pivotal in human history. Heracles, better known to us as Hercules, is born because the great god Zeus lusted for a beautiful mortal woman. She, however, is a faithful wife. Zeus takes on the appearance of her husband and manages to have her. The outrage is compounded by the fact that Zeus himself is married to one of his sisters, Hera. The notion that the gods are not always ethical, not always honest, is also one that makes sense when you think about it. And the Greeks seem to have been comfortable with it for, for many centuries. It makes sense because if the gods are humans, but better off somehow, more strong, more powerful, immortal, they never have to take the consequences of anything they do, whereas humans do. The burden of acting ethically, of thinking about consequences, be falls on human beings not on gods. Hera is unable to vent her anger upon Zeus. In a move entirely characteristic of a Greek god, she turns her wrath on the child born from her husband's infidelity. Heracles is perhaps the most famous Greek hero, a figure particularly important in Greek mythology. Even in his infancy, Heracles is endowed with extraordinary strength. Hera sends deadly serpents to his cradle, and Heracles strangles them both. Many of the Greek heroes did in fact have one divine parent and one mortal parent. More generally, a hero was a man of more than normal strength, uh, who was somehow marked out for a life of achievement, but also a life of, of enormous difficulty. Uh, they were very difficult uh, to integrate into society precisely because of their great capacities. The vengeful Hera continues to pursue her husband's illegitimate son throughout his life, periodically driving him into fits of anger and madness. Deeply regretting the murders and other crimes he commits during these fits, Heracles undertakes great tasks of repentance, often the killing of tyrants and monsters. At the end of his life, Heracles is granted immortality and taken by his father Zeus to live with him on Mount Olympus. And thus, the story of Heracles may have paved the way for the Apostle Paul, who brought word of a new faith to the Greeks centuries later. They had a story of a son of God, Heracles, who suffered and died and then went through an apotheosis, himself went up to Olympus. And so the story of another son of God who suffered and died and went to heaven would not be all that unfamiliar. In, in the same way, the notion that a god could take on human form and look exactly like one of us 
was completely acceptable to a pagan Greek audience. And so early Christianity proceeded in Greece uh, and struck roots in Greece quite easily. Not quite a Christ figure, but elements of, of that, because it was someone, someone who their toil and suffering and labor and loyalty achieved divinity. While Heracles is unique, he is only one of many heroes who walked among the Greeks. There are Achilles and Ulysses, great warriors of the Trojan War, and Theseus, whose feats include killing the dreaded Minotaur, the creature that feasted on the flesh of Greek youths. But heroes did not have to be offspring of the gods, nor were they necessarily heroic in today's terms, risking grave danger for the sake of others. For the ancient Greeks, a hero was someone who broke the bonds of ordinary life, regardless of the consequences. It's not necessary that a hero be descended from a god or a goddess. It's not necessary that a hero even do something good in life. And so achievement is more doing something extraordinary and being recognized for it. Now the extraordinary thing that a hero could do could even be killing a number of the enemy or killing people in his own community in such a strange fashion that the gods have to be consulted so the heroes are dangerous, unusual individuals, extraordinary, but not necessarily extraordinarily good. Heroes really are a projection of what it is to be human on a large scale. They really focus both the uh, great potential of human beings at their best, and also the, uh, the vulnerabilities of humans. Another unlikely hero is Oedipus, who kills his father, and marries his mother. Having fulfilled his terrible fate, Oedipus then blinds himself and seeks redemption. It is a story for the ages, speaking to the darker side of feelings between parents and their children. I think there definitely was a thread of Greek culture and of Greek mythology which was interested in the conflict between father and son. Obviously, Freud, Sigmund Freud, saw this in, and picked up on it in the story of the Oedipus and the Oedipus complex. And I think there was a thread of generational conflict that the Greeks actually feared but recognized as real at the same time. The story of Oedipus and his parents raises another age-old question. Are the lives of humans preordained? Or do humans have the power to exercise free will? Oedipus is someone who, for no reason ever given, has, uh, has this fate that he will kill his father and marry his mother. When Oedipus has realized that he is not the son of the king of Corinth as he thought he was. He says, I count myself the child of chance. And by chance, he means something very random. Uh, there, there is no plan. Um, by the end of the play, it's turned out that everything he has ever done has fit into a plan. And that uh, if he is the child of chance, it's chance in the sense that closely allied to fate. He, Oedipus, the man, made choices. When he learned he was going to kill his father and marry his mother, he fled his home, not knowing he was adopted. Um, and of course meets his father on the road and kills him and, and arrives in the city and marries his mother. Um, he chose to leave his home. Um, he, he did a terrible thing, but he didn't do it trying to do evil. And fate didn't make him do it. The question of a person's fate versus the role of free will was of such importance to the ancient Greeks that they personified fate in the form of three goddesses. 
when you read the poetry of Homer, it seems that it goes two ways. On the one hand, the fates are a group of three women, Clotho, Lachesis, and Atropos. Their names mean the weaver, the allotter, and not turning back. And they weave a thread for each person's life when that person is born and determine when that person's life is going to end. On the other hand, we see in Homer's poetry that fate is a power above the gods. The gods bow to fate in several instances. You can look at the story of Oedipus and talk about fate. Was he fated to kill his father and marry his mother? Yes. What does that mean? Does that mean he didn't have any free will? No. It doesn't mean that. It means that's what was going to happen. The Greeks had a complicated view of how the world worked. On the one hand, the gods controlled a lot of actions of human beings or had an effect upon it. But yet, the humans also could control their own individual destinies and call a lot of the shots. So there's this funny relationship between what the gods control and what humans control. And you know what? They loved this ambiguity. And so the ancient Greeks came to terms with the fact that there were no guarantees in life. Some of their concerns seem hauntingly familiar today. This consciousness that the Greeks have that you cannot have too many generations on the earth at the same time is even expressed in a myth, the myth of the beginning of the Trojan War, which says that the earth was burdened with too many people and cried out to Zeus to relieve her burden. And so Zeus invented the Trojan War to get rid of a lot of people. The stories of the gods and goddesses of ancient Greece are eternal. They still speak to us today. Among the deities were two groups of lovely sisters who dwelt on Mount Olympus, the Graces and the Muses. The Graces bestowed beauty, charm, and gratitude on the mortal world. The Muses had a profound impact on how generations since have passed the tales of the gods and the sagas of that long gone era through oral tradition. From their lofty plane, they descended to the earth teaching history, astronomy, and the arts. Each one of the nine muses is associated with a particular subject, usually concerning the arts and sciences. For instance, Cleo, the proclaimer, is the one that is associated with epic poetry and is the muse of history. Now the muses are very well known because we have words like museum, the seat of the muses that are in contemporary English, and of course Greek. Greek stories are about those things that people regard as important. They wouldn't have persisted if they weren't. I mean, if stories are going to last and be retold for several thousand years, there must be something in them that has meaning for the people who hear them across generations. Evidence of the divine was everywhere. To the Greeks, the gods were as real as the fields they tilled and the families they raised. The number of little shrines that would be all around the city, uh, the number of dedications to gods in big sanctuaries, really does speak to uh, pretty strong belief in them. Uh, life was felt to be fairly precarious and you needed to do everything you could to get whatever powers ruled the world on your side to keep safe. From cradle to grave and from season to season, every phase of human life was intertwined with the gods. As ever present as they were for the ancient Greeks, the same gods were not always worshipped throughout the land. 3,000 years ago, Greece was a patchwork of independent city-states. 
linked by a common language, culture, and trade. But while the principal deities such as Zeus, Prometheus, and Demeter were worshipped in all of the more than 700 different city-states, each town and village laid claim to its own god. The landscape of Greece is just full of gods. Gods who might not even be heard of in the next village. Every little stream, every spring of fresh water, uh, something you come to appreciate in the dusty Greek climate, has its own divinity. The hills divided up village from village and people from people. So each village was encouraged to have its own favorite gods and its own favorite heroes. And I think that, in terms of the natural layout of the land, was very important in the formation of myth and of their religion. The gods were many, as were their functions. Hermes was the protector of flocks and herds of domesticated animals. Hera was the goddess of marriage as well as maternity. Eros prevailed over matters of love. Hephaestus was the god of fire and volcanoes. Poseidon ruled over the sea. There was Pan, part human and part goat. He was recognized as the shepherd's god. And there was Artemis, protector of nature and the young. Artemis is associated with young, blooming nature, with young animals. But Artemis is also associated with the initiation of young women. So there's a continuum in Greek thinking between what happens in the natural world and what happens in what we would identify as a very different human social sphere. To Greek mythological thinking, these are all part of the same phenomenon. And that's why Artemis can be the huntress, the one who's associated with the wild, but also the one who tames young girls. Of all the deities that influenced human life, Demeter was one of the most important. Celebrated once every five years, she was the goddess of corn and crops. Greeks looked at and lived with their landscape for an awfully long time and developed stories by watching nature and by living with it. And the worship of a kind of earth goddess who protected the earth and saw to the welfare of the crops and withheld the crops if people didn't behave themselves. Uh, all of that was part of the Greek view of the cycle of nature. The relationship between man and the divine was not simple. However, theirs was an uneasy alliance. Though the gods were powerful and immortal, they were not beyond human questioning. The ancient Greeks often criticized the immoral behavior of the gods. They could act in excess. Each one had passions, had uh, made mistakes, but the mortals had to respect their own boundaries. This is the main difference between gods and mortals. Gods could do anything they liked, do as they please. Mortals had to refrain from excess. Greek gods and goddesses are facets of what could become of a deadly passion what could happen to mortals if they really step over a boundary. Now we might think of criticizing the gods as a kind of blasphemy, but in fact it reinforces the notion that the gods do exist. And I think what was really being criticized were other Greeks' attitudes about the gods. Something that's very hard for us to understand is that the Greeks could play with their notions of gods. Superior to the humans over whom they held sway, the gods were nevertheless subject to the same passions, failures, and weaknesses of mortals. They knew love, despair, and tragedy. They took on human form and were vulnerable to injury and illness. But unlike people, they healed quickly. Of course, they weren't just humans, they were different from humans in many ways. They first of all obviously never died, secondly they had incredible powers of strength and knowledge. But the reason why they're in human form is that the Greeks had tremendous pride in the human form. 
the Greeks had such high value for the perfection of human intelligence and physicality that they could not imagine a more perfect form to attribute to the gods. This notion that uh, the gods are humans plus uh, seems to have answered a very deep need in, in the Greeks. It's a sort of fantasy of overcoming all the weaknesses that make us humans what we are. The gods were also subject to similar laws which governed humanity. Hermes was the guardian of travelers. When he cleared a pathway by killing the hundred-eyed monster called Argos, he had to stand trial for the deed. Well, he killed, he's a god, but he's polluted. And so he had to stand trial. And the way the gods all cast their votes was by putting a stone at his foot, which made a stone heap, which is called a herm. Though the gods were not perfect, they were not powers to be trifled with. What you did need to do was be careful not to offend the gods, uh, not to set yourself up as the gods' equal, not to be arrogant in that way, because that was inviting disaster, not from any other humans, but from the gods themselves. There's the story of Salmonos, who uh, had himself driven around on a cart, banging on shields or some noise-making implement, uh, uh, saying that he was Zeus and trying to imitate Zeus's thunder, and he was probably dispatched with a thunderbolt. I think everybody believed that somebody really powerful had to be in charge of lightning, and the obvious candidate was Zeus. Zeus was a weather god, primarily, in fact, when it rained, you said, Zeus is raining. You didn't say, it's raining. And so, lightning, just this powerful, strange thing that can kill you, obviously had to be under the control of someone like Zeus. In Athens, the people also worshipped a god with no name. One who was simply referred to as the unknown god. The shrine to the unknown god was probably the Athenians' way in their own religious system of covering their bets. Just in case there was a god out there that they hadn't managed to worship, a god that might do something to them, they had a shrine to the unknown god. The Greeks rationalized the world around them. Philosophy and intellectual thought flourished. Most of all, in Athens. It was here that Athena presided in noble splendor over the people. Goddess of war and patron of the arts. She was honored in the form of a gold, ebony, and ivory statue at the Parthenon. It was believed that her symbolic presence would make the city invincible to attack. Thousands came to pay tribute to her here, in one of the finest buildings ever constructed. But of all the sacred places in ancient Greece, few approach the significance of a tree-lined valley of unsurpassed beauty and strange power. For it was here that the Greeks came to learn of their future. This is Olympia. 2,500 years ago, a 40-foot high statue stood here it was made of gold and ivory and was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Dedicated to Zeus in celebration of his omnipotence, this ancient wonder presided over the oldest known organized sporting event on earth, the Olympic Games. Every four years, the Greeks from all over the Greek world and the islands and Italy would come to Olympia to celebrate this festival. Restricted to only males, including spectators, naked athletes competed for crown and glory under a burning sun in five events. The broad jump, discus throwing, javelin hurling, wrestling, and the 200-yard dash. While the object of the games was to win, 
the purpose was to worship. According to one scholar, David Sansone, he believed that the athletic event is an expenditure of ritual energy for the gods. And in fact, one way of showing this is that what the athletes did was sweat. And they sweat and they had dirt on them and they had olive oil on them. And after they finished competing, they cleaned off the scum from their skin using a strigil. And they actually collected the scum from the athletes, which was thought to have magical properties. And in a sense, they were reaping the product of human energy and having this as a magical potion that the gods would honor. This then was Olympia. And to this day around the world, winning an Olympic event remains an accomplishment beyond comparison. When I had the luck to win the Olympic Games and, and, and come first, uh, my country hadn't had a first place in any Olympics for over 50 years. All this was very exciting for, for a young person. You know, the idea that you get onto the podium, uh, your achievement is honored only by a, a, a medal and nothing else. You hear the national anthem of your country, you see the Greek flag going up, these things remain in your mind. And I, I've, I've often said that that is the greatest feeling uh, in my life other than getting engaged to my wife. Another site central to the ancient Greeks is Delphi. Mystical and mysterious, Delphi is perhaps best known as the place where a famous oracle resided. Also known as the Oracle of Apollo, she provided clues to those who sought insight into the future. The Oracle of Apollo was a priestess who was named the Pythia. People would come from all over the known world to seek the advice of this priestess for important questions, often affairs of state, political questions, and direction. Unfortunately, the oracle spoke in a language no one could understand. Her pronouncements on the future had to be translated by a prophet. But even then, her prophecies were often obscure. There's one famous ambiguous answer in which uh, a great king asks the oracle, should I go to war? And the oracle says, if you go to war, you will destroy a great kingdom. And so the guy goes to war, and of course, his kingdom is the great one destroyed. And he should have read that the right way. The oracle always gives you a kind of question in return, that you, a puzzle, an enigma that you have to answer. Humans are born and they grow up and they make a choice to do this and to do that. At any point in their life, they could go to Delphi and hear an oracle like, beware of the sea because it will kill you. And you spend your whole life avoiding the sea um, so that you won't get killed. Then one day, you're in an aquarium and a tank bursts and you drowned in this seawater, in this saltwater aquarium or something more sensible than that. Did fate make that happen? No, it's just the God knew the future and could say that it was going to happen. Delphi was also the place where a son of Zeus presided. His name was Apollo. In addition to presiding over Delphi, Apollo had other responsibilities. He was the God associated with sexuality and love. Ironically, Apollo himself was never known to be a great lover. Apollo is beautiful. He's the most beautiful male, as Aphrodite's the most beautiful female. He is the best athlete. He is a beautiful singer. He is strong and a marvelous archer. He's your perfect human being, your perfect male. And he has this sad, sad life. He falls in love over and over and over, and none of the women want him. And he attempted to rape girls at certain occasions in his life. 
He's really a God, I think, of distance and rationality more than a God of love. Perhaps the most tragic of Apollo's romantic escapades was his love for Cassandra, daughter of the king of Troy. As Greek mythology would have it, Apollo and Cassandra's tragic affair would directly impact the course of history. He falls in love with Cassandra, who's a princess in Troy, and he says, you know, I'll give you the gift of prophecy if you will uh, sleep with me. And she says, okay, and he does, and then he, she rejects him, and he uh, makes it so that no one will ever believe any of her prophecies. And thus, according to Homer, a seemingly insignificant lover's squabble later played a major role in one of the classic battles of the ancient world, the Trojan War. The Greek stories of Homer told of a glorious day in which all the Greeks actually did one thing together. They did an expedition and they fought the Trojans. According to Homer, the conflict begins when Paris, son of the king of Troy, kidnaps the beautiful daughter of a Greek king. Furious at the abduction, the king and his brother unite all the leaders of the Greek world to join in an attack on Troy. For ten long years they lay siege to the city, but to no avail. Troy is a fortress, all but impenetrable. And then a Greek general named Odysseus comes forward with a plan that will echo through history. He suggests the Greeks build an enormous wooden horse and pretend to leave Troy, as if the great horse were a parting tribute. But Helen, the Greek princess, who has now fallen in love with her captor, knows her people well and suspects a trick. Helen, who went uh, and imitated the voices of many wives of the uh, companions of the Greeks um, and walked around the Trojan horse, hoping that some of them might hear the voices of their wives and really cry out. Odysseus was the one that restrained his companions from revealing themselves. And so, Tragedy awaits the unsuspecting Trojans. The horse is brought inside the walled city. But they have one more chance when Cassandra, the Trojan woman who spurned the god Apollo's advances, also tries to warn her fellow citizens. Another warning came from Cassandra, the Trojan princess. She had been given the gift of prophecy by Apollo in exchange for uh, sleeping with him. But in the end, she refused. So Apollo made sure that nobody would believe in her prophecies. And thus the god Apollo gets his revenge on Cassandra, the mortal who spurned him. It is unfortunate for the citizens of Troy. After much feasting and celebrating, the Trojans fall asleep. Late at night, under cover of darkness, the Greek armies return. Within the walled city of Troy, Odysseus and his men slip quietly out of the wooden horse's belly and unlock the city gates. The Greeks storm through the now open gates and lay waste to the city. But revenge does not a better lover make. Apollo would remain a failure in affairs of the heart. In stark contrast to Apollo in the area of romance is the other god who presided over Delphi, Dionysus. Dionysus, on the other hand, is a guy you'd expect to have a lot of luck with the ladies. He's, he's a god who is a god of the vines, he's a god of wine, 
He's a god of vegetation. He's a god of the sea. So he's a god who's been described as a god of the fluid element, a god of fluidity. And I think that's an excellent description because he's a god who can induce madness on the individual. Your mind can turn to a fluid mush if you're under the influence of Dionysus, whether it's through drink or through some religious ecstasy. Strong emotion is Dionysus, formal expression is Apollo. Of course, that idea, which is as well known as the division between classical and romantic, is no longer valid. Yet, the idea of relating Apollo and Dionysus was one that was quite pertinent in antiquity. During the three winter months at Delphi that Apollo was absent, Dionysus replaced him. Dionysus is the god of civic disorder, but also the god of imperial democracy, whereas Apollo is the god of civic order. And thus, as is so often the case with the gods of ancient Greece, there is a moral to the story. In this case, the lesson lies in the very contrast between Apollo and Dionysus. Dionysus is a god who who is worshipped by women and is worshipped in the countryside and leads women out of their homes, away from their looms, uh, in, to the tops of mountains where they dance all night and carry torches and uh, men thought drank a lot. We think about Apollo as the god of reason, as the god of order. On his temple at Delphi, there are all these things. It says, uh, nothing too much made in a god, nothing too much moderation in all things. While the gods loved, battled, and ruled over earth and sky, beneath fertile folds and sun-drenched landscape of ancient Greece lay another domain, a dark and foreboding place. When the Greeks of ancient times died, they were either buried or cremated. Beyond death lay the underworld, a type of shadow existence where there was no conscious afterlife. No one went to heaven. That was the exclusive domain of the gods. After death, we have a soul, according to the Greeks, which is called Psyche, which goes fluttering off like a shadow of smoke into the underworld. Now, when you get to the underworld, this place is called Hades, or it's sometimes called the House of Hades because Hades is the god of the underworld. And there's a journey that the soul has to take. The journey was across the fabled river Styx, or river of hatred, with a man named Charon to ferry the soul over. You have to pay Charon your obols or two obols to get across the river, and that's why these coins were put in the mouths of the corpse upon death. When you got there, the first thing you meet is Cerberus, this three-headed guard dog at the door to the underworld. You went by because you were a dead man, you were allowed in. If you tried to get in as a live man, you were eaten alive by this thing. In Homer's telling, Hades is a grim and dreadful place. It is so bleak, no temple for Hades exists anywhere. The underworld is described as a place where human spirits suffer an eternity of empty dreams. Hades is terrible and inexorable, but he is not the punisher of souls like Satan in Christianity. Psyche in Greek means breath, comes from a verb psychein, which is to breathe. Now, one, when someone dies, he no longer breathes. Psyche has uh, really been translated as soul. Now, psyches in the underworld have no consciousness. 
There are two levels to the underworld. The first, called Erebus, is where the human soul passes immediately after death. The second is a deeper and more terrible place called Tartarus. Those unrepentant and violent souls who have offended the gods are banished to dreaded Tartarus. One of the most famous characters who was put into Tartarus was a fellow named Tantalus. And Tantalus was made to stand in a river with a fruit tree over his head. And he was eternally thirsty and eternally hungry because whenever he reached to drink out of the river, the water would flow through his hands and he couldn't get it to his mouth. And when he reached for the fruit of the tree over his head, it would always move just out of reach. And so he was eternally tantalized, as we have the word from it now. Thus, the gods and their stories gave meaning to the different cycles of life, and even the possibility of an afterlife. They also helped the Greeks establish a morality and a body of ethics. In ancient Greece, one of the most advanced civilizations of its time, these stories eventually inspired the birth of a new art form, the theater. Later, playwrights such as Euripides, Sophocles, and Aristophanes dramatized them, allowing the epic tales to come to life for people throughout the centuries. The relation of literature to, to myth and religious belief among the Greeks is a very uh, complicated one. You have to remember that for them, literature, poetry especially, uh, was not the preserve of an educated elite. It was not even originally uh, meant to be read. It was publicly performed. It was accessible to everyone. They had various kinds of performances. They had oral poetry, choral dancing, drama, but they would never think of it as something like one category, and especially they would never think of reading this material. You had it performed. And, and therefore, it's much more deeply embedded in the local culture. It's not something that only a few people do read these works. It's something that everybody hears and sees. Some of the early authors crafted their plays and poetry around themes which were critical of the gods something which later philosophers vehemently condemned. Plato's criticism of traditional literature and, and of the stories in them uh, was that the gods essentially didn't act like gods. I think Plato especially was very uncomfortable with that because of his own notion of what a god ought to be. You can see some of the same critique in Euripides in his tragedies, his sense that, you know, gods shouldn't really act the way that a lot of the myths he's treating dramatically show them. Certainly when you look at a drama like the Ion, in which Apollo is represented as a rapist, you begin to question the value of a god like that. Some philosophers believe that redemption is the moral of the story. By the end of the play, the woman who was raped becomes the mother of Apollo's son, Ion. He goes on to become the leader of the city-state of Athens. Many of the plays reflected the more tempestuous side of human nature in the conduct of the gods. Sexuality and affairs of the heart were controlled by Aphrodite, the goddess of beauty, love, and fertility. Just like Apollo, Aphrodite lived a turbulent life. Aphrodite was connected with warfare through her union, her affair with Ares, the god of war. And they were two famous lovers. Aphrodite wasn't actually married to Ares. She was married to Hephaestus or Vulcan, the god of the forge. But she had this flaming affair with Ares, the war god. And the question is, why are these two always getting together? 
It's the fury of their mutual passions which made them uh, two gods that were beyond the control of all the other gods. And as the saying goes, you know, that every lover is a soldier on a campaign. Thus, early Greek writings conveyed life's everyday lessons. And yet, some of the works reflected a blatantly sexist attitude towards women. One example is the story of Hippolytus. He despised women, he despised female sexuality, he was chaste, chaste, pure. We'd send him to a psychiatrist, but pure, pure as the snow. His stepmother's nurse, handmaid, went to Hippolytus and told Hippolytus that his stepmother was in love with him. Hippolytus was appalled. He was horrified. When Greek men got together at the drinking parties, at the symposia, we know that they told stories, that they produced poetry, which made fun of women. In early Greek culture, women were seen as consumers of men's effort. The man had to farm, the woman simply consumed the effort, stayed at home, cooked, and was always on the man's back. And it's a strong misogynistic strain in Greek literature all the way through the 5th and the 4th century. And so, great dramas and comedies unfolded in amphitheaters throughout the land, with all male casts playing the roles of gods as well as goddesses, mortal men as well as women. But the Greeks were not the only ones absorbed by stories of deities and heroes. Others were watching too. Far to the west, across the Mediterranean, a great new empire was being born. The Greek gods and goddesses, like classical Greece itself, would know the ravages of time and change. As functioning deities, they would eventually slip into the mists of history. And yet, they have not completely disappeared. Even though they're, they're not part of our religion, uh, we still uh, need these stories. They're, they're wonderful, rich, richly suggestive tales about how the world works and what we are as human beings. Generation after generation of modern students love and are fascinated by these myths. And I think that springs from something we all have in us, which is a, a desire to make stories, a need to understand the world by making stories about it. Greek mythology has transcended the centuries coming down to us not only from the great poets and playwrights, but through the conduits of many other cultures. One of the first was Rome, far to the west. It absorbed much of what Greece had to offer. The Romans discovered Greek religion really in the third century BC and began to make a, a bigger deal of it than it had been before. We know that there had been cultural contact for a long time, but there was a kind of prestige to the Greeks uh, that the Romans felt they didn't have. And so they took over, really, the Olympian system and aligned their own local gods with more recognizable, high-status Greek gods. In adopting the gods of the Greeks, the Romans imbued the pantheon of deities with distinctly Roman characteristics. The first priority was to assign them Roman names. Zeus became Jupiter in their terms. Ares became Mars. Uh, Athena became Minerva. And when I say became, I mean that they had these gods existing already, Minerva, Mars, Jupiter, but they now aligned them in a new way that said, yes, we're part of a continuum of culture with the higher status Greeks. Other gods adopted by the Romans included Hera, who became known as Juno. Poseidon was renamed Neptune. Hades re-emerged as Pluto. 
Aphrodite would forever be immortalized as the goddess Venus. And so the Greek pantheon to large extent became the Roman pantheon. As mighty Rome developed into an empire, it eventually occupied a little-known, dusty corner of the Middle East called Judea. Here the Hebrews clustered around their capital city, Jerusalem, where a new religion was being born. Following the crucifixion of Christ, word rapidly spread of his teachings. Even Christianity found connections in Greek and Roman philosophies, particularly through the apostle Paul. We know that Paul was educated in Greco-Roman terms. He quotes Euripides at least several times in his epistles. Later on, notions that had developed in Platonism especially became crucial in the ways in which early Christians tried to make their religion more understandable to a highly educated class in the Greco-Roman world. In the Orthodox Church, even today, the Greek Christian Church, you still see some of the mysticism that you can identify in the works of Plato in the fourth century BC. The Christian belief that Jesus was the Son of God, yet born of a mortal woman, also resonated with the early Greeks. Because Greek religion was completely comfortable with the notion of gods interacting with human women, I think it helped in the spread of Christianity at an early period that a narrative like that was at its core. And so we'll never know cause and effect, and I certainly don't want to attribute early Christianity wholly to the Greeks, but it helped that the groundwork was laid. Despite the enormous cast of divinities that ruled over the Greeks, just a few centuries before Christ was born. A new idea sprang up among the people, the notion of the existence of only one true God. The Greek world shifted towards monotheism, I would say sometime around the 400s and 300s BC, with the advent of philosophy. And philosophers like Plato and Aristotle who were skeptical of the Greek religion, the way it was written in mythology, but they did believe in some supreme force, some supreme all-good, all-knowing kind of power. This movement toward monotheism in ancient Greece did not go unnoticed by the Apostle Paul. One day in Athens, Paul found himself addressing Greek citizens from atop the Areopagus, a hill that was a meeting place for a council of noblemen. But Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For passing by and seeing your idols, I found an altar also on which was written, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship without knowing it, that I preach to you. God who made the world and all things therein and hath made of one all mankind to dwell upon the whole face of the earth. Acts 17, 22. One of the most potent forces that shaped Greek thinking was an awareness of sin. But 2,000 years ago, the concept of sin meant something very different than the beliefs held by the early Christians. The Greek word for sin, the closest one, is a word that means to miss the mark, to, to err, to go wrong. Now, what does that mean? To sin, if you go too high, it means that you're stepping beyond human limitations. If you go too low, it means that you're not living up to your fulfillment. And so, for the Greeks, a sin was really not fulfilling who you are. Though separated from us by untold millennia, the great pageantry of gods, goddesses, and heroes, of muses, fates, and graces, of soaring accomplishments and bitter defeats, is as significant today as it was to the ancient Greeks. 
The interesting thing about the Greeks at that period who venerated these gods, that they gave to the gods the attitude also of human beings. There was the fighting, there was the jealousy, there was the adultery, there was the happiness, there was the truth, there was the peace. There were all the things that were going on in every day's life of uh, the human beings was also associated with the gods. And I think that that is part of the reason why these things have survived all these uh, centuries uh, uh, in the minds of people and identified in the way the Greeks think even today. Greek myths is a whole body of narratives. Say something very complicated about the world. Um, they, they speak to a kind of optimism and a kind of pessimism at the same time. Greek myth as a whole really does tell us through a lot of exemplary stories, a lot of different things about the nature of reality and the nature of life, what's important what we ought to care about. One of the major lessons is that to read any of these stories, which are timeless treatments of big human questions of personal morality versus the morality of the state and laws that are imposed, and how do you negotiate these very difficult questions of the best behavior as a citizen in the state, those are addressed by Greek myths and by Greek legends. And you are left with this feeling that we don't know really what these gods are or who they are. But you know, we know there is some force out there. There's some huge force that's controlling our lives and that we have to keep an open mind to what that force is doing. That's why the Greeks can speak across 3,000 years of history and tell us some questions, if not the answers, to some of the most perturbing eternal questions in the world. There was another world here once, and the gods and goddesses and people who lived here still haunt the landscape. Their stories still travel across time. As long as people seek a deeper understanding of themselves and their world, Ancient Greece lives on. All ye other gods of this great place, grant to me that I be made beautiful in my soul within, and grant that all my external possessions be in peaceful harmony with my inner man, with myself. Plato.